Thank you, Seth. And congratulations, Jeff. That was a good uh, verse to introduce our um, text this morning, which is Galatians 3, verses 15 through 22. It is a, uh, as I read through it, I think it's a, a, a somewhat complicated passage in that Paul is arguing for the promise that was given to Abraham as still being in force, which is to say that salvation is all of grace through faith alone. But we need to follow through uh, as, as we, we need to think as we follow through Paul's argument here. He begins, brethren, verse 15, I speak in terms of human relations, even though it is only a man's covenant. Yet when it has been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. It does not say to seeds as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed that is Christ. What I'm saying is this, the law, which came 430 years later, does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. For if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on a promise. But God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. Why the law then? It was added because of transgressions, having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. Now, a mediator is not for one party only, whereas God is only one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? May it never be, for... If a law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law. But the Scripture has shut up everyone under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Well, may the Lord bless this reading of His Word and then bless our time as we think our way through what Paul is saying here to make the point that uh, salvation is all of the grace of God. Let's pray. We hear often that in this world nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. Benjamin Franklin wrote that in a letter in 1789, so that statement has been with us a long time, and it's a uh, clever way of saying that there are no guarantees in life. And there's some truth in that. Weather unexpectedly changes, employment unexpectedly ends, health unexpectedly fails. Life is full of uncertainties. But it is not true that nothing can be said to be certain. God's promises are certain. They are all guarantees that will never change because God doesn't change. So His Word is reliable. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Hebrews 13, verse 8. That truth is the basis of Paul's text here in Galatians chapter 3, verses 15 through 22 where he teaches that God's promise of salvation is dependable because God is unchangeable. Paul has been teaching that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. He has established that from both the Word of God and the Galatians' own experience. But Paul's opponents were not ready to admit that. They would argue that the giving of the law changed the terms of salvation and added a new requirement. So Paul answers that. First, from the policy of human wills or human covenants, human agreements, 
to show that promises can't be broken. So if men keep their word, then certainly God will keep His. And secondly, He answers by explaining the function of the law. It was given not to overturn the promise, but to assist the promise by exposing sin and leading people to Christ. But he again begins his proof of the priority, the superiority of the promise to the law with an illustration from human relationships and the way that men make agreements. Once it's been ratified, once it's been settled with a, a handshake or a signature, it is binding. Paul says in verse 15, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. Paul may be referring to the, the Greek practice of drawing up a last will and testament, which once it was finished and deposited in the public records office of the city, no one could change it, not even the testator, that is the, the one who made up the will. But whatever the specific legal arrangement Paul had in mind, a will or a covenant between two parties, the, the general principle is plain and universal. Once a contract is made and an agreement is reached, once one of the, the parties involved can't then come back at a later date and change the arrangements of it. The contract or covenant is legally binding. Paul's point is simply that the promise of justification through faith made to Abraham is permanent. If, human, if a human contract or covenant can't be added to or voided after the two parties agree upon it, then certainly God will not cancel His covenant and promise made to Abraham. In fact, the, the certainty that God will keep His promise is clearly indicated by the way in which He made the covenant with Abraham. It's recorded in Genesis 15. He did it in a ceremony that was very common in the ancient Near East. The, the Lord instructed Abraham to kill some animals, to, to cut them in two, and then place them in rows so that there was a path in between them. It was the custom that when men made covenants, they would do this. And then they would walk together between the slain animals as an expression of their, their promise to keep the agreement. Oh, well, this is what God instructed Abraham to do. But when the Lord came, he alone passed through the animals. He did not allow Abraham to go through them with him. And what it showed is it was a unilateral covenant that he made with Abraham, which is to say it was a one-sided covenant, an unconditional covenant in which God signified that he alone stood behind the promise and he would not fail to fulfill it. So if sinful men can't change an agreement, a will or covenant, and are expected to honor their oaths, then we can be sure that God will not violate His promise. He will keep it. And the promise was not only given to Abraham, but also to his offspring. As Paul points out in verse 16, to his seed. Now that doesn't refer directly to the multitudes of, uh, of Abraham's descendants, but to one person in particular, to Christ. That's how Paul explains it. He's referring to Genesis 22, verse 18, where God said to Abraham, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Paul interprets that word seed of Christ based on the observation that it is singular, not plural. He does not say, Paul writes, and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one, 
and to your seed, that is Christ. Now, in fact, the word seed in both Hebrew and Greek is a collective term. And what that means is it is singular in form grammatically, but it can also refer to a plurality. Our word, for example, offspring, is the same. It's like that. It, it can refer to one or to many. Paul, of course, knew that. He wasn't making a mistake here. He knew seed could mean the, the people of Israel. In fact, he uses that way. It uses it that way in the book of Romans to refer to the nation Israel and to its, its people. But he knew that that seed or offspring was also used in the Old Testament as a singular noun for one person, for a definite descendant. And he knew that it had to be singular here and had to refer to Christ because only he could fulfill the promise that God made of, of blessing all of the nations of the earth. So it is Christ who is the heir to the promise given to Abraham. And the only way for people to participate in that great promise and have the blessings of that covenant is to be joined to Christ. And the way to be joined to Christ is through faith. It's to believe in Him. That's how we take hold of Him. That's how we enter Him. So those who have the promise of Abraham are not those who keep the law which no one does, as Paul has pointed out. But it's those who are of faith. Paul said that earlier in verse 7. It is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. Faith is what characterized Abraham, the man who believed and it was reckoned to him unto righteousness. Well, the law changed. The law, I should say the law did not change that. <clears throat> it can't change that. It was a late addition. Paul points that out in verse 17. He says that the law came 430 years later. The promise had been in force for nearly 500 years, long before the law was established, which proves the, the superiority, the priority of the covenant with Abraham over the law of Moses. If, if salvation were now by law-keeping, the promise to Abraham would be invalid because the law and the promise are opposites. They don't mix. The law and promise cancel each other out. John Stott put it this way. He wrote, in the promise to Abraham, God said, I will, I will, I will. But in the law of Moses, God said, thou shalt, thou shalt not. You can't have it both ways. Either God is the guarantee of the promise, or we are the guarantee of the promise. But if it has changed, if God has replaced the promise with the law, then He completely changed the agreement, which means God went back on His Word. That's impossible. God is faithful to His Word. That's Paul's meaning at the end of uh, verse 18. But God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. God granted the inheritance. He gave it to Abraham. That word granted really makes Paul's point. It, 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 the idea of, his, of, of this word granted is given freely. Salvation is a free gift and a permanent gift. He has given it and it is still in effect. That's the point of the grammar, the, the tense that Paul uses there. He gave it and it is still given. Nothing has changed. There's some truth to the statement, in this world, nothing can be said to be certain. There are no guarantees. People, people break promises and circumstances change. The unexpected happens. But that is not so with God. 
Everything is certain in our relationship with him. He gives guarantees that are reliable. Circumstances change, but his promises never do. His character never does. Isaiah wrote, all flesh is grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. And Isaiah had a beautiful illustration of that. Before his eyes, every spring, living in Jerusalem, which is a a rocky place, those hills around it are rocky and barren so much of the year, but after the, the rains of winter, spring is a beautiful time all over the land, but in that particular place, and the grass grows and the flowers come up. In fact, years ago, I don't know if it's still this way, school children in Jerusalem would get out for half a day and they would go with their teacher to look at the wildflowers, which are they're, they're colors that I've never seen before. It's everywhere. But then the hot winds come off the desert and before long the grass and the flowers are gone, withered, blasted away by the heat and the wind. And so Isaiah saw that and saw how temporal things are, how transient they are, but he says the Word of God is not like that at all. It's as beautiful as the grass and the flowers, far more beautiful, and it stands forever. That's true of the gospel, which is the word of God. It has always been by grace alone, through faith alone, always, from Genesis 3.15 to John 3.16. And by implication, God's guarantees are true for everything. All of his promises are firm. After all, if, if he will do the greatest thing, if he will give us salvation, if he will give us eternal life, well, he will bless us with all of the lesser things. If we can count on him to deliver us from eternal destruction, then we can certainly count on him to deliver us from the temporal trials of life. We all tend to worry about the future. It's typical of all of us to do that in one way or another. We worry about something. We worry about pandemics, about our health. We worry about the economy, about the, the market. Is it going to go up or down? We, we uh, worry about our employment. But God is faithful. Isaiah said in chapter 40, that great chapter that I just read from, that God sits above the circle of the earth. It's a great picture of the Lord God as absolutely sovereign over this world. In fact, over this entire universe. However you want to en envision the universe with uh, multiverses as some theoretical physicists are speculating now, it doesn't matter. It's all one great universe. And it, as great as it is, it's like a speck of dust to him because he is infinite and eternal and it's temporal and limited. And he controls it all. He controls it and all of the circumstances of it, all of them. And so we're absolutely secure. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, do not be anxious for your life. And then he, he, he recommends looking at nature because nature is filled with examples of this. And one of the examples is the birds of the air. They don't give much thought to the birds of the air. But he says, uh, look at them, how God provides for them every day, always provides for them. And then he says, <clears throat> the, the rhetorical question, are you not worth much more than they? If he provides for the birds, he's going to provide for you. So Paul asks in Romans 8, verse 32, <clears throat> that if God sacrificed his own son for our salvation, and in doing so, gained that salvation for us at such great cost to him, well, won't he with him, with his son, freely give us all things? If he's given you the greatest, won't he give you the less? Of course he will. Certainly he will. God is faithful to his promises in spite of us. 
His faithfulness is grounded in Himself. It's not grounded in us. It's not grounded in circumstances. It's grounded in God alone, and He cannot deny Himself. Now, this was an oath that He made to Abraham. He promised him a future inheritance, eternal life. And that promise involved a Redeemer, it involved Jesus Christ, and Abraham received that through faith. What Paul has demonstrated then is that the law cannot invalidate the promise. The promise was established first, and the, the, the law cannot overturn that. God cannot break His Word. But that raises a question, one that Paul was anticipating, which he states in, in verse 19, why then the law? If the law has not added new conditions to the promise, if salvation is apart from law-keeping, and we receive the inheritance, the, the promise of eternal life, as a free gift then why did God give the law? God doesn't do meaningless things. But Paul's teaching on faith suggests that the law was meaningless. So how do we explain that? We know that can't be so, that God would do a meaningless thing. So that question is asked. Paul knew this would be on the minds of some. Why then the law? And Paul answers that the law had a very important purpose. No, it wasn't meaningless. It had a function. It was added, he says, because of transgressions. It was given for the purpose, purpose of exposing sin in order to make it known. Paul explains that function of the law in the book of Romans and wrote in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, that through the law comes the knowledge of sin. We learn about sin through the law, through this righteous perfect standard of God's character revealed in the law of Moses. And then in Romans chapter 5, verse 20, he stated that the law came in that the transgression might increase. Not only exposes it, it causes it to increase. In other words, the law actually had a provocative purpose. It not only exposes sin, but it makes sin obvious. It actually stirs it up. It, it, it causes it to increase. It gives strength to sin. It is the, the principle of the forbidden fruit. We can't have it, and so we want it because we can't have it. The law provokes that kind of response did in Paul. Paul thought he was keeping the law, but then he had the 10th commandment, don't covet, don't desire your neighbor's house, and he started to covet. Well, that's what the law does. That's what it produces. And the result of it, it reveals the sin that is in us, that we might have not known was in us, but, but there it is. Now, the law isn't sin. It doesn't make us sin. It doesn't create sin. Sin is there lying dormant, so to speak, and the law brings it to life. It wakes it up within us like a, like a sleeping serpent. It stirs it up. Think, think of our condition as being like a glass of water that has been on a table for a few days, maybe on your nightstand, and over time it collects dust. But the dust settles on the bottom, and the water, perhaps as the sunshine goes through the glass, it looks pure, it looks clean, looks drinkable. But put a spoon in the glass and stir the water, and the dirt swirls, the water gets cloudy, and is seen to be what it really is. It's filthy and it's undrinkable. That's what the law does. It doesn't create sin. The sin is there lying at the bottom of our hearts. The law stirs it up for a purpose, and that is so that we know our condition. It reveals who we really are, and we need that because the heart, as Jeremiah wrote in Jeremiah 17, verse 9, is more deceitful than all else and desperately sick. 
Who can understand it? Psychiatrists and psychologists need to know that verse. That's the nature of man. Our heart is so wicked we can't understand it. It is so sick we can't begin to understand why we are the way we are. No one will understand the nature of man and understand the nature of our hearts apart from the revelation of God. And that's the specific purpose of the law of God. To let us know, to make it known. It reveals our condition, and in revealing our condition, it reveals our need. The law does have an important purpose, an essential purpose. It reveals sin, but it has its limitations. It reveals sin, but it doesn't remove sin. Only the gospel can do that, meaning only the person and work of Jesus Christ can do that. And so Paul says the law was added. It was brought in next to the promise until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. The seed is Christ. And the law was for the purpose of preparing Israel for its coming Messiah by showing Israel its need of the coming Messiah who is a Savior. So the law's purpose was preparatory and temporary. It was given only until the seed would come. Once he came, the law had served its purpose. Paul will develop that later in the chapter. In fact, the inferiority of the law to the promise is seen from the way the law was given and administered. Paul wrote, the law was ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator. The mediator was Moses. Israel received the law from him, and he received it from angels indirectly from God. But the promise was not given in that way. There was no mediator between Abraham and God. The promise came directly from God. The law is not on that level, not on the same level with the promise. Paul explains the significance of that in verse 20. He says, now a mediator is not for one party only, whereas God is only one. This is not an easy verse. Bishop Lightfoot wrote over a century, uh, more than that, ago, that uh, there are up to 250 or 300 interpretations of it. So we'll go through them one by one. (laughs) I suppose there are even more than that since he wrote that, but I'll give you what I think is the right interpretation, which is the promise is greater than the law because it is unconditional while the law is conditional. The promise depends uh, upon God's faithfulness. The law depended upon Israel's obedience. Man will always fail. God never will. So the promise is superior. Now, this contrast that I make there is seen here in the verse between the law and the promise. And that's indicated by the fact that the law had a mediator, Moses, which indicates that the covenant God made at Sinai was a, a, a contract between two parties. A mediator implies two parties, two persons, or two groups of people. And the mediator is the go-between. And and the two in this contract were God and Israel. And Moses was in between them, carrying out this contract. The success of a contract, again, depends upon obedience to the terms of the contract by both parties. And that means Israel had to obey the law perfectly in order to receive the blessings of the agreement. The promise, on the other hand, didn't have a mediator. God is only one, Paul says. It wasn't an agreement reached between two parties. God and Abraham didn't make a bargain. God stood alone in this arrangement and made a promise. And the promise depends completely on him. It depends completely on his faithfulness, not Abraham's. 
as he said, I will, not thou shalt. So the promise is greater because it cannot fail. It is the content of an unconditional covenant. But this raises another question. Is the law bad? Is it contrary to the promise? And are the two opposed to one another? And Paul answers that in verse 21. He says, may it never be. It's a very strong way of making a denial. Some have uh, interpreted it as God forbid. The law and the promise could never be in conflict with one another since both come from God. The problem is not the law. It's man. Paul writes, for if a law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law. If, if men could keep the law, then they would be righteous and they would have life by their own doing, by their own obedience to the law, the standard that was given, and there'd be no need for a Savior. We can save ourselves if, if we can keep the law. But no man can do that. It's not the law's fault. It's not a failure of the law that man can't keep it. As Paul wrote in Romans chapter 7 and verse 12, the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. The problem is man isn't. But that is the reason the law was given, to show us that, to, to expose our spiritually bankrupt condition and the hopelessness of all of our efforts at keeping the law. People who strive to meet God's standard by keeping the law are like Sisyphus. He is a character in a Greek myth who was forever condemned to roll a huge rock up a mountain. And the problem was, once he got it up the mountain, it would roll back down. So he'd have to do it again and do it again. Th that's how he spent eternity. He was condemned to fruitless labor and despair. And that is the man under the law. The law, the man can't keep it. The law can't be kept. Righteousness can't be achieved. All of the, the heavy lifting that one might do with the greatest intentions is fruitless labor. And that is by design. The law was intended to exhaust a person who tried to keep it. People have, 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 have to roll that rock up uh, and then when it reaches the top, it rolls back down. That's the experience of law keeping. It, it never ends. It never reaches success. It, it reaches exhaust. It causes the person doing it to reach exhaustion and despair. As I said, that's done by design. That's the purpose. The law doesn't give hope because the law doesn't give life. Just the opposite. It condemns. It's, it's like a judge in jail. That's how Paul describes it in our last verse, in verse 22. But the Scripture has shut up everyone under sin. It imprisons us. This word used uh, of people being, uh, of, the, of being shut up in something is used of being trapped in a city, and it's used of fish being caught or closed up in a net. That's what the law does. The law catches the confident. Those who think that they can earn God's acceptance by law keeping find instead that they're rolling a rock up and down a, a mountain and it never ends. It never succeeds. They find that worse than that, they are in prison and in fact, they're on death row. And the law doesn't provide an escape. At each point, that person tries to gain God's approval by works. There's failure. The rock rolls down the mountain again. And each time, each time, there's condemnation for failure until, until a person despairs. 
I don't know that there's anything worse than despair. The feeling of utter hopelessness. No way out. That's a terrible condition. But that's a good position. The law was given to bring people to despair because only then will they realize that they cannot save themselves. They need a Savior and they turn to Him. So the law is not contrary to the promise. It serves the promise. It, it was given to make things worse so that people could become better. As Luther put it, God uses the law to terrify us in order that we might be driven to grace. God wounds us, he said, in order to heal. He kills in order to make alive. There are two ways set before us. The way of works and the way of faith. The way of law, which is one of achievement and merit. And the way of promise, which is one of gift, of free grace. God is unchanging in the way He deals with people on both of those pathways. God is inflexible in His justice because He is immutable, unchangeable in His holiness. So the person who seeks to justify himself by his deeds is held to that, to that standard, to that impossible standard. He must obey perfectly, 100%. As God, as God said in verse 10, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the law to perform them. Everything. And so the person who thinks himself or herself to be good and who hopes to be uh, accepted on that basis, if you're here and that's how you think, ask yourself this. Have you ever had a bad thought? Have you ever been selfish? Have you ever violated one of the Ten Commandments? Now let's make it simple. Have you just kept two commandments perfectly? Have you loved God with all your heart and loved your neighbor as yourself? Salvation by works means salvation by perfect works in thought and deed toward man and God. And if you hope to achieve that for yourself, then, as Mr. Spurgeon said, you might well hope to drink the Atlantic dry. It's impossible. The law shuts us up to that truth and the reality that God punishes sin. He must. He's holy. He's righteous. He's just. He must punish sin. Now that too is an unchangeable truth. That is a guarantee. God is immutable in His justice. As the writer of the book of Hebrews said, God is a consuming fire. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But the living God is also a merciful God. And He blesses faith. And to those who see their utter failure through the law and turn to Christ for escape, God grants them forgiveness and life. God is unchanging in His love and grace to all who look to Him, to look to His Son, who uh, abandon all of their self-efforts and simply look to the cross for salvation and cling to that through faith. Well, may God help you to do that if you have not believed in Jesus Christ. He died in the place of sinners. He bore the penalty in our place and gives salvation freely to all who believe. One of the great hymns of the faith, and one of my favorite hymns is Rock of Ages by Augustus Toplady. He put the matter so well when he wrote, Nothing in my hand I bring, Simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. By the grace of God, do that. Come to Him, trust in Him.
and live forever. May God help you to do that and help all of us to live in light of His sovereign good grace to us. Let's pray. Father, we do thank You for that. We thank You that You've given the law. You gave it to Israel. You codified it there at Sinai. But even men who didn't have that law had your righteousness written on their hearts by virtue of the fact that they were in the image of God. And, and either way, we're condemned. If we have a, a system we've thought up of our own out of a sense of ought, of, of what's right and wrong, we fail in that. Law exposes our weakness, failure, our lack of merit. We thank you for it. We thank you that you sent your son to do what the law could not do, remove sin and guilt and give us life. Thank you for him. And as we consider that in the moments before us, we pray that you would bless us and prepare our hearts for that. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, to prepare ourselves for the Lord's Supper, let's stand and sing... Him 267 on the sheet that you may have, but otherwise in the red book. 267, nothing but the blood. Observe the Lord's Supper. I want to read a couple of verses out of Ephesians chapter 1, beginning with the third verse. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. All that we have that is good, every blessing that belongs to us is bound up and has its source in our sovereign God's having united us with his son, Jesus Christ, who while present with us here today, uh, resides on his throne in heaven. It is a spiritual union we have with him, one that the Apostle Paul uh, emphasized throughout this first chapter of his letter to the Ephesians that's been pointed out to us here uh, many times in many different places by many different uh, people. Uh, the multiplicity of expressions that Paul uses to indicate the truth. We are in him. Uh, in the beloved, in Christ, predestined to adoption through Jesus Christ. If we likened it to a broken record, it can only be so if we think of the needle stuck on our favorite part of the song. And perhaps the loveliest chord is the one we have in verse 7 now of Ephesians chapter 1. In him... We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. We are the church of Jesus Christ, and if the church of Jesus Christ, then we are the church of the forgiven. Our sins washed clean by the blood shed by our leader, the head of the church, and the one we remember again this morning in the manner in which he commanded us when he said, do this in remembrance of me. These elements before us uh, point to the offering of his body and blood on the cross to purchase us out of our bondage to sin and to make us his own inheritance, the adopted sons and daughters of his family. And if you're here this morning and you by faith, have trusted in his saving work and so believe that he has purchased your forgiveness, then we invite you to participate with us in the Lord's Supper, remembering that these emblems of bread and wine, uh, the Lord Jesus said, stood for the death he offered of himself on the cross to save us. He took the bread, he said, uh, this is my body, given for you, do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup also, 
and said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Now I'll give thanks for the bread. Lord, thank you for this bread, which reminds us that uh, you are God incarnate. You took on human flesh. You pitched your tent among us, and we beheld your glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And we rejoice in that. We praise you, Lord, that as Dan mentioned from Romans 8.32, that as God did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, you do freely give us all things. And the greatest thing is that you delivered the Lord Jesus over for us. We give thanks in his name. Amen. I'm going to read from 1 John chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. Well, what are those works of the devil? The works are sin and all of its consequences. Sickness, death and sorrow, the confusion and chaos he has brought to mankind, the personal ruin, regret and self-destruction he has caused. In John 8, verse 44, a verse similar to the one I just read, Jesus called Satan a murderer from the beginning and the father of lies. But Christ came to destroy all of that, to remove it and replace it with truth, purity, and peace forever. That's what we remember as we take the Lord's Supper. That because he paid for our sin, every sin of every believer he has redeemed us out of this fallen world and gained for us permanent forgiveness. As a result, someday there will be no more darkness, no more error, no more failure and guilt, no more struggle, no more fight, only glory, joy, and adoration for our Savior for all eternity. That's our future, and that future is certain. Let's give thanks for the cup of wine that speaks of his death for us. Father, we do thank you for this emblem, this wine that speaks of the blood that was shed violently for us in a sacrifice for us. We did what we could not do for ourselves removed our sin as far as the east is from the west, removed our guilt from us. And as a result, through faith in him, we are clothed in white, in righteousness, and accepted by you now and forever. And we give you thanks for that. Thank you for the death of your son. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's close with the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Christ's name, amen. Keep looking to Christ, the author and perfecter of faith and by God's will, and we'll see you next week. Have a good week.